So you'd see these things being emphasized and no real statistical analysis being conducted. And so we had uh, Susan Boyd, for example, who wrote Killer Weed, uh, who illustrated that, that the media inevitably will tell all these stories and people inevitably think things are way worse or problematic than they are until you you know, do a proper statistical analysis and say, well, seven fires, but there's 38,000 crows. <laughs> you know, I think one of the, the best stories arising through the trial was the, it was, it was we were in trial uh, in April of uh, 2015, and uh, the 420 was on across the way from the federal court over at the old courthouse plaza there uh, in those days. And um, so I forget the number, but 32 young people or something like that had been checked into St. Paul's or VGH as a result of eating too many cookies. And uh, the Crown made a big thing of that on the Monday. And uh, Judge Phelan, uh, again, that illustrates this point about uh, statistics and stories. You know, he said, well, how many? And, and uh, they said, oh, 32 young people went to the... 32, he says, you know, it's 38, uh, that's, that's no worse than a soccer game. <laughs> so the judge was uh, very, you know, in touch with the reality of people saying all kinds of emotional things versus looking at the actual statistics and whether something is significant or not, and not being, you know, easily overcome by, oh, you know, 32 young people. Um, which unfortunately still occurs. People, for some reason, uh, don't realize that they have to wait an hour or so with an edible and how strong it gets going through their liver and, and they keep eating them and then don't feel very well. But one very important fact in the science that still seems to get uh, ignored from time to time is that there's no lethal dose for cannabis. And unlike the opiates and other things that we see doctors prescribing on a regular basis, um, we don't have that uh, problem with cannabis. So um, we had some just top-notch uh, people who came forward and testified, uh, gave affidavits, uh, you know, uh, experts on fire safety, experts on fire risk, experts on mold, uh, horticulture, uh, uh, all insurance, all these things. and. Uh, I think managed to cover all of the issues that uh, are arising, uh, but most importantly, we were able to uh, totally discredit people like Corporal Holmquist, who was the major officer in charge and, and producing all of the statistics and so on and so forth, uh, and our Chief Lynn Garris from Surrey, who would go on and on about all the fire issues. Um, and so we were able to. Uh, convinced the judge that these people were biased and um, uh, just not credible or reliable in the grand scheme of things. And so uh, he granted the declaration that the medical marijuana, medic marijuana for medical purposes regulations were unconstitutional and were defective and uh, enabled patients who qualified under the MMAR or their designated growers to continue. It's an interesting thing about the designated grower thing because we always assumed that they would be subsumed by the licensed producer, somebody growing for you. And so we said but there should be an allowance for a true caregiver, uh, somebody who stands in the shoes of the patient so that the patient could still have somebody do it for them, but as a caregiver, as opposed to just the general DG, to try and make sure that there was, at least that was left. And interestingly enough, the, the court really didn't uh, address that. They, they simply left the DGs in place, and uh, so people were able to continue to have a, a designated growers. I mention that because that was one of the things that they often try to say is the big, uh, source of abuse was that designated growers were growing huge amounts and selling it out the back door, uh, uh, you know, just supplying patients with the basic, what they, what they needed. And there's no question there were some abuses, but uh, I don't think it was limited to designated growers. There were some patients doing the same thing. But again, 
I don't know what the actual facts and figures are. Undoubtedly, it was happening to some extent, and probably still is, is occurring to some extent. Uh, but um, there was no concrete evidence uh, of the extent to which that was happening. And so the court obviously didn't buy that the designated growers were the source of the problem and, uh, and left them intact. And so we have ultimately got that decision in, in uh, February of 2016. Um, we did uh, have an intervention because of the Smith case that came down and was in front of the Supreme Court of Canada, so we were able to uh, get that in front of the court where the Supreme Court of Canada reaffirmed all of the law that we were arguing and uh, pointed out that the limitation to dry marijuana was also an unreasonable limit and unconstitutional. And so we had the benefit of that on the issue of the limitation to dried marijuana. So at the end of the day, the decision affected uh, the people's possession and use of it in all of its forms. And so um, we made further submissions on that before the final decision. I got the final decision, <clears throat> but there were still these problems of the 150 gram thing was carried forward, and uh, I think that was probably the major one. We we actually tried four times <laughs> to get, uh, whether it was Judge Manson or Judge Feeland or the Court of Appeal or Judge Feeland again afterwards, uh, to modify that part of the of the decision to, because of people going to camps, people, you know, moving or going away. And, and that was the other issue, moving one's license, which was a problem because you had people who had to move. They, the place had a fire, not from the grow, or the, they had to sell their property or, or there were tenants and they were given notice because of these things that were going on. And so there were people who were put in a position where they had valid licenses and yet they weren't able to continue uh, due to circumstances beyond their control. And so they were then basically forced to, uh, to either uh, go to an LP uh, or to the illicit market, which of course were the dispensaries. Um, although I have to say on behalf of the dispensaries that there's an argument there too that they too are providing reasonable access and that the restrictions uh, against them uh, are, are similar to the restrictions placed on people's ability to grow or attempts to take that away. So it's going to be interesting to see how, how that all uh, turns out as, as time goes on. But basically, um, we were able to take on the federal government and Health Canada in particular, represented by the Department of Justice. We were able to uh, critically examine uh, their position and all of the stuff that they were putting forward to try and discredit uh, what was going on. Uh, we were able to uh, hear from the Israelis. We were able to hear from uh, the people from Holland. Uh, it was uh, uh, quite uh, fascinating in that we were able to hear from a number of experts uh, and from different countries uh, who have lots of experience uh, with uh, various things. And um, so at the end of the day, uh, bearing in mind again that not everybody that gave affidavits was examined or cross-examined, nevertheless, uh, by the end of the day, Judge Phelan had a huge amount of evidence to consider both written and uh, the transcripts of the evidence before him. And uh, of course, to our great uh, pleasure, decided that yes, the MMPR was unconstitutional. It didn't provide reasonable access, uh, forcing people to have to get their supply from a limited number of licensed producers, uh, not knowing whether you were going to get it uh, or the strains that you wanted or all these sorts of things just wasn't uh, good enough and wasn't uh, complying wasn't providing reasonable access and therefore you still had patients whose liberty was being impacted, the security of their person was being impacted, um, and so they were still being forced on occasion to choose between their liberty and their health 
Uh, another thing that's protected by Section 7 is decisions of fundamental and personal importance, and obviously uh, one's health uh, it falls into that category, and so that was another basis for, for the Section 7 decision. So he found violation of Section 7 and uh, granted uh, declarations to that effect and uh, continued the injunction of Judge Manson with still the 150 grand limit uh, until further order of the court. And so that's important for people to remember that, that if you are grandfathered under Allard, you remain grandfathered under Allard until the court says otherwise. And maybe the Department of Justice or the government at some point in the future may try to undo it. Uh, we don't know. Um, and so we have uh, a constitutional convention here, and I should maybe explain this if you'll remember at Smith, the, often the court grants a, a declaration that the law, the statute law is unconstitutional, and then gives the government a period of time to try and fix it up. And it's a convention or a protocol that's developed in constitutional litigation. Um, and so often they get six months to try and fix it up and make it constitutional. And that's kind of, to some, is, can be a problem because you've declared the law to be unconstitutional. So how can you continue it for six months and put people into this position? That, Smith's a good example where the Supreme Court of Canada refused to give the government any period of time to fix it up. They simply said patients are going to be affected right away and you know, what do you need six months for? We're simply saying it's cannabis in all of its forms. So there was an example where the court declined to, to give the six month or three months or whatever. But Judge Phelan, on the other hand, in his decision, declared the MMPR to be unconstitutional and gave them six months to fix it up. On well, February 24th, 2016, they had to come up with a new set of regulations by August of 2016. And so what the government did was they basically took the MMPR, Marijuana Medical Purposes Regs, and put them in part one to now the Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes Regs, ACMPR. So MMAR to MMPR to ACMPR. And they took the old MMAR and put it in part two with a few tweaks. And that's essentially the ACMPR with them saying clearly in their announcement that this was temporary and because of the whole legalization thing that was also being looked at by the government by this time. And so <clears throat> um, essentially uh, what's developed since then is that we've had the task force on legalization and regulation um, address medical by saying, well, we should probably leave the existing scheme in place for, say, five years uh, in order to see whether one needs a separate and distinct medical uh, setup as compared to legalization. Because many people, and certainly the police and the doctors and all these folks, they want it to be, okay, it's legal, it's one thing, and, you know, you don't have a separate a medical issue. We, I think, were able to convince the task force that no, you know, if you're going to say four plants and and 30 grams and limits like this on people in terms of general legal or recreational or personal use, um, that's not what the, the issue for patients is determining what they need for their particular medical problem. And that's a, something that's between the doctor and the patient uh, in order to determine what works. Just like if you go to a doctor and they say, take a couple of these pills, come back in a month, and let's adjust the dosage. You know, nothing much different to that. But So the, the task force rec recognized that, and so at the moment we're in a situation where for the next five years anyway, we probably will have this ACMPR scheme. Um, maybe the MMAR will continue. I've certainly recommended to people online and elsewhere that there's not no harm in applying under the ACMPR because you don't lose your MMAR. The only way you lose your MMAR if the court says so. So there's nothing to lose in going through the ACMPR, hopefully getting the same reasonable access as you got under the MMAR, and then 
you've got both. And so if the government ever then does try to change things, it will no longer be that important that you were also under the injunction. However, <laughs> many people have experienced problems under the ACMPR. Uh, problems with doctors who have been to colleges have uh, come down on them and have tried to make them uh, have these permits only last for three months at a time instead of a year. Uh, doctors, many doctors, know nothing about whole plant medicine. They're used to, you know, pills and stuff like that. Advice from the pharmaceutical industry and the blue book and so on. And so, uh, naturopaths, doctors of traditional Chinese medicine, people like this usually know more about it, and so you would hope that they would consult with them uh, because they are, do have this role as the gatekeepers and it's a role that they, they don't like. So we've had lots of people having trouble in terms of getting doctors uh, to approve them, and we've also had uh, problems in terms of dosages with them trying to reduce people's dosages simply based on the I guess the Israeli testimony that the Health Canada re repeats always about the one to three grams. The problem with that, of course, is, is that sure, most folks probably can do one to three grams, but that doesn't mean there aren't large numbers, as all of the plaintiffs in LR were, of 20, 20, 25 grammers. You know, so basically, um, the situation is now where we have both. If you can get covered under the ACMVR, great. But if you're having trouble, I want to know about it. I, I, I want to hear uh, uh, so that we gather evidence uh, of the problems being experienced under the ACMVR. So that if the government ever tries to undo the injunction, or if we simply need to do something to show them you know, that they're not providing reasonable access under the ACMPR, in other words, to, to try and compel them to do so. We need the evidence. And so I've already received quite a few. Um, in relation to the doctor issue, uh, uh, people should know that as a result of this, uh, there's a group called Practitioners of uh, Medical Cannabis, and they've now got some doctors in other countries that have joined them. So that's uh, good. I mean, usually the medical profession would develop a specialty and so on, but uh, this is an initiative by doctors themselves, not their colleges, that have created this group. They're all very knowledgeable people. Uh, many of them, some of them testified and, and so on. Uh, Carolyn Ferris, for example. Um, and um, so what I'm trying to do is uh, and it's not always that easy to interpret some of the statements we get, but to try and get the basic information, get it to a coordinator of PMC, practitioners for medical cannabis, and have them try and find a doctor, depending upon where the people are, for them, uh, or uh, have one of them uh, do it. No, I'm not sure. And, uh, sorry, not sure. Uh, this is one part that I'm interested in on this point. I think we should note it for the record is that the Canadian Medical Association, not just the Israelis, the Canadian Medical Association sent out a letter to all doctors in Canada suggesting not to sign for more than one to three grams. And definitely, um, from our, our feedback, is that anything over five grams, the Health Canada will phone the doctor and remind them of the suggestion of the CMA. Well, I've heard that, but then at the same time, I've, uh, and, and especially in the early days, that uh, people anything over 10 were having a problem. Uh, but I have seen patients who've been approved for 40 grams a day mm -hmm. and have said they never had any problem. And the doctor never had any problem. So it's hard to figure out exactly. Uh, Ian Culbert was the doctor who, uh, I don't know what his exact role was, but he chaired this thing on television the other night about the medical thing. And the doctors keep going on about, you know, people sh shouldn't get it until they're 25 because of the developing brain. I noticed they seem to have dropped the fact that they used to say that but women's brains developed at 19. And so I always used to say, well, how come you're holding the women back till 25? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, but it's really, uh, ridiculous. Um, this emotional fear reaction that still exists out there in relation to cannabis, 
my experience is is that people who've had a, a son or daughter maybe become addicted and think that they started with cannabis and they're emotionally like a victim of crime but it's hard to be rational and, and have a rational conversation with people and, and again some police and mayors who are concerned about because of the stories about grow-ups and stuff and yet you know again there's no lethal dose it's been around a long, long period of time, and given the numbers, the, the problems are pretty insignificant. Uh, and more importantly, from my perspective, is we know that uh, tobacco smoking is the one of the, if not the, number one killer every year in Canada. And the maximum penalty uh, for furnishing uh, tobacco to an under 18 year old for example, in a public place, the maximum, for the worst case scenario, would be two years imprisonment. Um, and so there's no indictable offenses in relation to tobacco. Uh, sure, there's all kinds of rules about advertising and distribution and all the rest of it. Uh, and we have been very successful in educating people about the problems of tobacco without having to use the criminal law. And then you look at booze or alcohol, and people can make as much beer, wine, and spirits that they want, share it with their neighbors, as long as you don't sell it. And there's all kinds of rules in the Excise Act and, and uh, in liquor control and licensing uh, statutes provincially and so on to do with booze. And what are the maximum penalties for booze? Again, <clears throat> generally two years is the highest, two years imprisonment is the highest penalty. And so, uh, and, and alcohol is the number one drug problem. You know, tobacco may be the one big killer. Alcohol is a big killer too, but uh, you know, so I'll just say you compare those with now what the government has proposed in the Cannabis Act that's supposed to come into force almost a year today, well it's July 1st it will be, and they have left in, even though there's a ticketing scheme for the basics, and maybe I should quickly put that out. You'll be able to grow up to four plants per residence, not resident. Uh, those plants are not to be more than 100 centimeters tall. And I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. And um, you uh, are subject, well, you're allowed to possess up to 30 grams if you're over 18. Interestingly, uh, if you're 12 to 17 year old, you can possess five grams, uh, and it's not an offense. Um, they have rules about distribution, which involves giving and sharing, and so that's not an offense in terms of the 30 grams for adults. It's not an offense for the youths of 12 to 17 either, but certainly adults can't sell or provide to youths. That's a big no-no. And um, so it's a ticketing scheme with a $200 fine and a victim fine surcharge if you grew five or six plants, if they were 150 centimeters, if you possess maybe 50 grams. Um, but if you go over that, they've left in place the whole criminal law scheme uh, of summary conviction up to two years and indictable offenses up to 14 years. Now, trafficking, possession of the purpose of trafficking currently is life and has been for a long time. Production is 14, it used to be seven. Harper government jacked it up to 14. The effect of that was to take away uh, a judge's ability to sentence you to prison, but have you serve it in the community. Because if there's mandatory minimums or 14 and up, you can't get that. So we really, if, we need people to address the government on this. You know, why do they need to have indictable offenses and uh, all of these huge penalties uh, still in existence uh, for cannabis? If uh, you know, the max is two years for tobacco and, and alcohol. I mean, there's a major inconsistency there that's not warranted by the evidence in relation to cannabis. And so we need to. That they're still thinking drug war 
and we need to get them to stop thinking drug war on, and on, to realize. On that note, I'd like, I'd like to circle us back just to close okay. out the trial. We've covered the chronological stuff on the trial. This will be easy to chop up. But what's important, I, I think, um, circling back to the trial, um, one, it's historic, and I'd like you to just um, on the record, why was it historic? Why were we awarded substantial amenities? Um, how uh, it, it became a public interest case, the first ever cannabis public interest case in Canada. Um, these are some of the things I'd like to kind of touch on. That's the historic nature. We'll get into your personal, like I wanted to get yeah. John Conway the person after this. Okay. Well, I mean, basically, uh, you know, cannabis has been illegal in Canada to possess it or grow it or traffic in it or possess it for the purpose of trafficking since 1923. It was put in the schedule to the then Opium and Narcotic Act. Uh, people need to know that we had been kicking out Chinese people for possession of opium product before that. Uh, the U.S. had brought in cannabis uh, in individual states uh, before that. Uh, the U.S. didn't uh, federally make it illegal to 1937. But you had all of this hype about cannabis, the reefer madness stuff about cannabis, the, the focus on, and there's a number of theories as to why with alcohol prohibition coming off, this was the new drug on the scene, and, and so it, slowly each state, uh, you know, the fear was there that this was going to be the next problem, they all passed these rules, and then finally the feds passed the rules. There was no problem going on in Canada, very, very few incidences of cannabis possession and use in 1923, and really not much until the 60s. In the 60s, the uh, youth of the day uh, determined that this was uh, an interesting thing, and people started getting involved in it, as well as LSD and other things. And uh, so all of a sudden, white middle-class kids were getting busted for cannabis offenses. And the penalties, we had mandatory minimums of, of six months and things like that. There were serious penalties. And so they had to quickly move in the 60s to undo those penalties so that white middle class kids wouldn't go to jail. And so and there was, that was the beginning of Normal USA, the national organization that formed the marijuana laws. Uh, eventually Normal Canada, the national organization up here. Uh, lobby groups to try and convince the government that a lot of this was nonsense and to overcome this emotional reaction that uh, existed out there in terms of reefer madness. And you would think, given what we know about cannabis, that it would be relatively easy, but as we've discovered, reason, uh, logic, and rationality, and evidence uh, sometimes has little to do with uh, political decisions. And so, you know, we had Ladane back in early 70s as a result of this huge increase in people's interest in cannabis. And Ladane said, you know, that's the Ladane Commission. The Ladane Commission, uh, Justice Ladane later, who's a federal court of appeal, uh, was, you know, the, the, the penalties and the offenses and the use of the criminal law is worse than anything to do with, with the use of cannabis. And then that follows earlier royal commissions going back to 1873, I think, was the first one. And if you go, there's a good book called Marijuana Myths and Marijuana Facts. It's got a whole table of all of them. And since Ladane, we've had, of course, uh, the Senate Committee more recent, to, well, even that's 10 years old now. Um, and so every single uh, report pretty well on cannabis that's ever been done, every royal commission and so on, has basically concluded that, you know, it's a bit ridiculous to be using the criminal law basically for this. But nevertheless, there's this emotional thing there that people, and, uh, you know, it's d uh, drugs and, and, and the, the belief in the stepping stone theory, which has been discredited over and over again. So <clears throat> that's why... Uh, this case uh, was really important is because we had judges and, and people, some people anyway don't understand this, that you've got politicians who make decisions and say things based on all kinds of information, valid and reliable or otherwise. Uh, judges hear evidence. Um, juries hear evidence and in fine and great detail. And they make decisions based on the evidence. 
And so the courtroom was the appropriate place to try and have a judge uh, listen to the evidence and not be distracted by the distortions and the emotional reactions and sift through all of that and come to some decisions. And so it was a good example of where the police and the fire people and others were going on and on about all these problems when in fact they were fairly relatively low compared to the bigger picture. And so through a court procedure we were able to establish that. And we were able to establish, remember this was is, is medical and not recreational because there would still be people who are, are uptight about the recreational aspect of things. But here we had solid evidence going back some time, in fact some of it very ancient, but a lot of good current modern evidence as well, that this plant and what's in this plant can help lots of people for lots of medical situations without the side effects and other problems that come from mainstream allopathic medicine prescribed drugs. And so, you know, we were able to have witnesses and experts and testify and uh, put this evidence up and counter the media distortion stuff, not to blame the media, just it's there and so it needed to be straightened out so that the full correct picture was there. And fortunately we were able to do that first with Justice Manson so that we got the injunction which was huge. Uh, and then, I mean, everybody, at least in the police and so on, thought there's no way we were going to succeed at trial. Uh, we were able to do the same in front of uh, Judge Phelan, and uh, Judge Phelan was, was reasonable and, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, helpful, open to, to the evidence, and, uh, and we were able to not only discredit all of the stuff the government was putting out, but also put forward uh, the, the real situation, if I can put it that way, in terms of helping people who have medical problems and, and to show people who had gone off all of their prescribed drugs and were now only doing cannabis. And so, uh, you know, the, the doctor allopathic medicine control uh, was essentially challenged uh, to show that here was a drug that um, could help and do all sorts of things uh, and take people off many opiates uh, and give them better quality of life than being zonked out on heavy drugs on a daily basis.